You are listening to Perplexity. What would you do if you found a set of six-toed footprints in your home that seemed to walk up the wall? Is it possible for a farmer from the 16th century to send messages to the 21st century through a 1980s computer? What would you do if you felt the presence of an invisible entity in your home? This is the story of Ken Webster of Doddleston, England, his 1980s computer, an allegedly time-traveling farmer, and the Doddleston messages. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Perplexity, a Mystery Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Kadra, and if you're new here, welcome. I tell tales every single week that have perplexed me. So if you love a good mystery that leaves you wanting more, you're in the right place. And I am so excited today because I have a very special guest. I've got Believing the Bizarre podcast here, Tyler and Charlie. Hello. Hey, what's up? Thank you for having us on. Of course. I'm so excited to have you guys. I love your podcast so much. And I came across this story several weeks ago, and it just seemed like a perfect one to do with y'all. So thank you for coming on. This is gonna be a lot of fun. I know. I can't. I was actually thinking, like, what if I, what if I just do this episode? <laughs> That's all I could think <laughs> about. Because we're recording this Saturday. I'm like, oh, found my time. I would never, obviously. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited though. I, and we like your podcast as well. I was actually uh, the other day just listening to your Christmas UFO one. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I thought that would be a really fun topic, and I hadn't done a lot of alien episodes, so that means mm -hmm. a lot. Such a podcasting voice. You do. Like oh, seriously. Thanks. So whatever that means to you. <laughs> That yeah, means a lot. That with, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm a speech pathologist in like my career. And one of the things that I do with some patients is voice therapy. And I'll hear that from patients sometimes. And it's always so nice to hear. They're like, you have a great voice. <laughs> yeah, not gonna lie. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what did you guys think of the questions at the beginning? Like any thoughts? I was ready for the music. <laughs> I know, right? I mean, time traveling farmer is kind of insane. Uh, can I can I be honest? I've I've uh you heard of this? I've heard this story. You know the whole thing? Yeah. Did you no, lie to okay. me like I'm 30 excited minutes to hear ago when you like version. he told me 30 minutes ago. He's like, I don't know what I this is about. I didn't, and then she asked the questions. I was like, oh, no, <laughs> it all came back to me. Is this gonna be our episode next week? Maybe. No, it's not. <laughs> no. Honestly, I wouldn't be mad if you guys did it no. too, because it's Never. it's just such a good story. Yeah, I I thought I knew this story and then I just kept digging and digging and digging. So I'm curious if anything I bring up is going to be something that maybe you're not super familiar with, Charlie. We'll see. <laughs> maybe you only went like four feet deep. I feel like I don't know the whole thing. Like I didn't hear the thing about the footprints before. Okay. And like the first thing I thought it was, I was like, that's a fairy. A fairy? You thought yeah. of a fairy, really? Yeah. S okay. Six, six toes going up a wall? Yeah. Well... We'll we'll get to the size of the footprints later, and maybe you'll rethink. But that's a really interesting theory. <laughs> big fairy, yeah, it's a big fairy. <laughs> okay, so our story begins in autumn of 1984. Ken Webster was living in Doddleston, located in Cheshire, England. He was teaching economics at a local high school and was somewhere around his mid 20s. We think, but we're not totally sure. He enjoyed contemporary music and he loved old cars, specifically Jaguars, which will play into part of the story later. He also had a new project. He was renovating this rundown 18th century brick stone cottage style home he just got. Uh, it was called Meadow College, or co not college, Meadow Cottage. Okay. And that is in the pictures that I sent you guys. And I feel like the pictures add a lot of context because when you hear Meadow Cottage, you don't think of what this picture is. So uh, if one of you could describe this photo. Go ahead, Charlie. It's, uh, it's not just one house. It's like a terraced house. So it's a couple houses next to each other. It's, it's brick and it's got little picket fences that aren't white they're really red and they match the doors and they're beautiful and it is very england like i saw this house earlier i was like this is it screams uk to me it looks Definitely. like when you walk to the kitchen that the floor is going to squeak the whole way down. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> well and i didn't know that in the uk i know i have some listeners in the uk too so if i don't explain this correctly please let me know but my understanding is they don't necessarily have like 
an address. It's like each house has a name. So like Meadow Coll Cottage, I don't know why I keep saying college, is like basically the the address of the house. Like each house just has a name. So when you pull up like house deeds in this area, that's how you find it. It's like a drop down and just the name of the house. So I thought Wait, that was really interesting. So if, if you build a house from scratch, is it like a birth certificate? Like yeah. you have to name, gotta name it. You got to name it? I think yeah. So. Wow. That's a lot of pressure. What would you name a house? See, that's the thing. Like I feel like... I guess kids are different, but like, if you like what yeah. I would name a house when I was like 25, 26 and bought a house is not what I would name a house now, but you can't, maybe you can change it. I'd, not, I'd name mine the dog pound. Go Browns. <laughs> You've been in the Browns for like a year. You're yes. up in money though, sports betting. So I could see why you would. I love that. Uh, That's such a good question. What would you, what would you name your house? <laughs> what would you name your house? Yeah. What would you name your house? Well, so my I do enjoy video games in my free time and my nickname has kind of become K Dragon. And so I think oh. it'd be like K Dragon's Lair or something oh, like so that. Oh, so good. You know, we mail stuff to the UK. I don't know why this never, maybe I just thought they had like fancy street names. Probably. The reason I wanted you guys to see the picture too is because as we get into the story more, I think it's important to keep in mind, this is basically a duplex. And then there's like a little side street and the basements were like or the crawl spaces were like connected to each other so there's like okay. three houses they all have access to the same crawl space there's the shared walls so just things to keep in mind for later shared crawl space that sounds terrible isn't that weird i don't like or that you can make it a clubhouse a cl it's crawl space <laughs> have you ever been in a crawl space yeah especially like my spiders or your spiders that's that's the extent of sharing you know, crawl space. Put some fairy lights up in there it'd be a good time yeah if you, like I, we're short like we're both like five seven five eight but no we're not not chilling in a crawl space i'm five four and i don't think i would want to go in a crawl space <laughs> no one no one should want to i don't want to know what's living under there yeah. so Ken Webster, the one who just bought this house, he was in a relationship living with his 19 year old girlfriend, question mark, possibly red flag, given her age, uh, named Debbie. And again, we don't really know Ken's age. We're like estimating his age, but Debbie was 19. She okay. was also a teacher and debbie ken all of their friends they were all into music so like debbie played the saxophone ken i don't know what he played but he liked music so people this was kind of like the hangout house people would go in the house all the time and have like jam sessions and play music ken maybe also <laughs> maybe you might have been right charlie I'm, i might have been very wrong about that <laughs> you might have been yeah. Uh, Ken got a really good deal on the property and he was looking forward to fixing it up and just building a life with his girlfriend, Debbie. But not long after they moved in, strange things started happening at the Meadow Cottage. On various occasions, they started noticing their personal belongings had been moved around and sometimes reorganized and stacked on top of each other in very strange ways. Bottles, cans, and boxes would be stacked up sometimes over four feet tall. At one point, they found their metal tins of cat food had been neatly stacked into the shape of a pyramid. There were also times they would leave groceries out, leave the room for maybe a few minutes, and go back to find them all neatly put away. So this part reminded me of Skinwalker Ranch, like the original haunting there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this sounds like a dope cleaning person ghost though you know what i mean like i need this ghost <laughs> it's I, I yeah it's questionable like is it a brownie is it poltergeist activity is it them and they're pranking each other it's just strange yeah i don't know that's i mean it would freak me out like i i'm joking i'd be freaked out if it happened but if, if you're gonna have the ghost move your stuff might as well put him away you know? true the footprints were the next thing that happened. So kind of getting into those questions from the beginning. So one day, a set of what appeared to be six-toed footprints were found on the cottage walls, seeming to have walked between the bathroom and the kitchen and up the wall. It seemed like the dust that was on the floor, whatever this thing was, had like walked across it and tracked the dust up onto the wall. And that's how you could see these footprints. And they appeared to be human, just with a sixth toe. They were about a size five. Size five is not very big. <laughs> Definitely could be a fairy. Is it like an extra pinky toe? 
I wonder. That's what I kind of deduced from the sources I read. Uh, Ken Webster would end up writing a book about this. And I know there's like, it's one of the most well-documented England mysteries, like of all time. So they might go into more detail on that in his book. I'm not sure though. So of course they like see these footprints and they're like, okay, this just maybe is, maybe it's a prank or maybe it's something weird that like was left behind from the last homeowners, some weird shape on the wall. I don't know. So they don't really know what to make of it. They paint over it. But the next day, Ken walks downstairs and he sees something weird out of the corner of his eye. So he does a double take and the footprints are back. But this time they're in a slightly different position. So it's like this thing walked up the wall again. Ah, it's so I'm not a ghost expert, but if it's tracking dust, it makes it feel like it's a tangible physical thing. Like I I know ghosts Mm -hmm. can move things and spirits have like I'm trying to quantify or qualify a spirit a spirit, which I can't really do. But it makes me feel like it's a physical entity that's doing this. What do you guys think? I agree. What do you think, Charlie? I don't know. I think I think that it could be something manifesting as a, as a physical entity. Like, you know those like crybaby bridges and like you the, put like hands. flour on the back of your car? Like there isn't an actual thing there, but there's still prints, right? That's a good point. That's so good. maybe mm. it's something like that. Mm. So it's it maybe when it has the most energy, it's able to manifest into like at least feet. Yeah. Or something like that. And why go up the wall? That doesn't make sense to me unless it is actually trying to manifest energy through like some kind of reaction. Could be or like going upstairs or just imagine you're hanging in the living room and this thing you can't see is standing upside down. <laughs> I, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. They also started to get the sense that they were being watched. They began hearing the sounds of what appeared to be footsteps. And this sound would be on and off, but they would hear it coming from the roof. Sometimes they would even see unexplained shadows out of the corner of their eye. Ken initially suspected a friend of playing pranks, but things seemed to be going to another level. A witness to many of these events was their house guest, Nicola Baguli, who went by Nick. Nick was a good friend of Ken and Debbie's, and she was staying for an extended period, so she was like a roommate. She also had a really creepy experience in the house. One night, she's laying in bed, and she sees a shadowy figure appear outside of her bedroom window. And as horrifying as this is, what's even more horrifying is the fact that she lived not on the first floor, but on the second floor. Another time while Ken and Debbie were laying in bed in their room sleeping, Ken awoke to Debbie screaming. There was a shadow figure standing in their room. Ken shot out of bed, but the second he turned on the light, the shadow figure vanished. He grabbed a baseball bat and searched the entire house and found nothing. There was also the time that Deb and one of her friends were sitting in front of the fireplace chatting when they suddenly felt an extremely cold chill in the air the room became so cold they could see their own breath then a powerful gust of wind blew through the cottage lifting a rolled up newspaper off of the ground and into the air breaking the rubber band off of the newspaper and forcing it open when ken came home he found deb and her friend screaming crying and horrified yeah i think that's valid yeah that's, I mean, how do you explain that away? Exactly. That's the That's thing is like, the more I got into this story, it's just like, there's so many elements to it. And it's so like, if this was a hoax, it's like one of the most elaborate hoaxes I've ever heard of, if not the most. Um, It's just crazy. It's pretty poltergeisty. Like it does make yeah. me think of a poltergeist. Um, and you said in the other person there was uh, Nick and that was a girl. Yes. So she basically um, had been on like some trip in another country, I think Africa. And then she like came back and she didn't have a lot of money. 
So mm-hmm. she was like, hey, can I crash with you guys for a while? And they're like, yeah, of course. It was like a good friend of both of theirs. And so she stayed in like this spare room upstairs. And it's sus right now. Can is sus? Yeah. Big red flags. <laughs> Although Dating a 19 year old. Well, uh-huh. yeah. But he also wasn't there for this experience. So if that wasn't real and if it was a hoax, it would be them playing the hoax on him. Oh, I didn't mean sus for this. I meant for his like real life. life. Yeah. 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 That's what I meant. <laughs> He, he, he didn't call her Debbie. He calls her Deborah. He's like, we need to up your age a little bit. It's actually not funny, but, you know, geez. So with all of this intense poltergeist-like activity going on, and also the cans being stacked into a pyramid, the six-toed footprints, it's also giving me, like, some alien vibes, but things are about to get even stranger, believe it or not. So Ken and Debbie's friend... Nick, who, like I said, had recently gotten back from Africa. She's staying with them. She is trying to figure out a way to make some extra cash. So she really liked writing and she got the idea to write these performance sketches. She said she was doing this to obtain an equity card, which I had to look up. Uh, It's an actor's equity association card. So I don't know. It's like a SAG thing in America. I think so. She wants to do all this writing, but computers are very limited during this time it was 1984 and she's short on money but she knows that ken is like familiar with the area so she's like hey do you know of a place where i can go get a typewriter for cheap and ken was like yes but also i work you know at this high school and there's this program where you can like check in and out these bbc computers And those are more convenient to type on than a typewriter. So let me just check you out one of those and you can use that. So he brings home this computer for her, gets it all set up in the kitchen. And I have included a picture of this computer in y'all's images. So could you describe this picture? Oh my goodness. So is this this especially for our Gen (laughs) Zers? Yeah. See, okay. Did you grow up with the monitor, like the big bulky computer in one room in your house? Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah. Charlie? I mean, yeah. Yeah. My mom was always on it. Yeah. Your mom was always on it? Always. The worst is like you want to hit up a friend on like Yahoo Messenger, but it's like, it's like in this group, like this main area. It's uh... Mine was monopolized by my mother. Okay. So that's fine. All right. So it looks like if you imagine an old television, <laughs> yeah. you imagine an old television, like a 21 inch TV that's black and white with a computer keyboard that you'd buy from Amazon if you or lost your good one. <laughs> and then I don't even know what that thing is to the right. Is I that... think that's where you put like what the hell are those things called? They're like squares. Oh, the floppy disk? Floppy disk. Yeah, I think it's a floppy disk thing. Is that it? is exactly what that is, Charlie. Oh, my goodness. Nice job, dude. <laughs> You're playing some roller coaster tycoon in here. <laughs> I don't think that thing could play that, dude. I just got Pong. That's it. Yeah. If Microsoft that. Paint. And <laughs> oh, keys. good times. That's why they're red, because they're hotkeys. You know, even yes. like... That's a good... Yeah. It's like it doesn't have like there is no Microsoft Word or like pages. So no. it's like this screen that you're typing on, it looks it looks like matrixy. But yeah. It's like one of those old they used to be like Dungeon and Dragons like words. Like mm. they would write like you were entering a cave, you were turning right. It's like one of those games. Ah. See, for me it's like instead of you're not writing front up front end on a website and you go like the source code, that's yeah, what it looks that's like exactly what that is. Yeah, it's literally just a black screen with green text. And like Charlie pointed out, the only way that you could like save anything was through a floppy disk. You couldn't save anything to this computer. And even on the floppy disk, as soon as you like shut off the computer, whatever you saved was gone. So it was like very, very limited. There was no Microsoft Word. They had what was called Ed Word, W-O-R-D. So kind of like a play on words with Edward. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And this is a BBC computer. And the nice thing about it was like with typewriters, if you messed up, you had to white things out and you couldn't rearrange text. Mm -hmm. But with this, you could. But even then, like, there's no internet, there's no games. This is all you could do. Like, you could literally just type, save it to the floppy, go print it out, like, maybe at a school or something, and that's it. This thing would would suck to move. Yeah. like I'm imagining Ken, like, he probably got a buddy to help him and, like, hey, bring your pickup truck. Yeah. I I owe you a pizza and a beer. Yeah. I got a, yeah, that's. 
Ken said it was really heavy and yeah. he would basically check out a computer for like weeks, a few weeks at a time and then return it and like swap it out for another one. Why? I don't know. But oh like he's he checking them in him. and out. <laughs> like, Please don't make me bring it back. Just it's the same thing. Um, it's it's very a big favor. Walls. You couldn't save anything off the floppy disk. I was like, that's like my memory. Like, I have a bad <laughs> memory. That's the I'm sorry. We can move on. Your mind is floppy disk? Is that uh, no, my mind is a computer that erases every time we end a conversation. What would be the floppy disk then? My phone. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's so fair. Basically, Ken sets up the computer in the kitchen, uh, plugs it in, leaves it switched on, and then Ken, Debbie, and Nick all go out for a few hours. So they left the computer on, and my understanding is like this would keep it remaining on but they they're gone for several hours when they come home they notice this pulsating green light shining through the window of meadow cottage when they get inside they find that the computer is still on and this pulsating green light is coming from the computer a strange message has been written on the computer screen and as if this wasn't eerie enough the style of the writing was not right there were innumerable spelling and grammatical errors, and it didn't seem to be something modern. So I am going to copy and paste this message into the Zoom chat. And who would like to be the old English man throughout this episode? Charlie. Yeah. That sounds right. Yes. Yeah. All You're right, made that's all for you. this, my friend. Ken, Deb, Nick, slash... True are the nightmares of a person that fears, slash. Safe are the bodies of the silent world, slash. Turn, pretty flower, turn towards the sun, for you shall grow and sow. But the flowers reach too high and withers in the burning light. Get out your bricks. Pussycat, pussycat, went to London to seek fame and fortune. Faith must not be lost. Where this shall be your redeemer. Excellent job, Charlie. Yeah. Thank you. I do it for praise. <laughs> I do what I can. So Nick had been working on her writings. So at first, Ken thinks like maybe this is something she had written, but Nick swears this is not what she had written. And she also goes into the floppy and there's two files and she's like, there shouldn't be two files here. And she opens the other file and she's like, this is what I wrote. Uh, so someone seemingly has created this new file and left this strange message. I was going to say, this is not a very good sketch. Like <laughs> objectively as a comedy, this is not a funny sketch. Right? It, it, yeah. it, you, it's a, if this is really them messing, if one of them is messing with the other two, they are doing a really good job though. I guess so. Just write nonsense. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing, too, is, like, if Nick had written this message, why did she address herself? Like, if yeah. it was her writing that she was working on and it wasn't meant to be, like, some, you know what I mean? Like, a message mm -hmm. to them. Uh, so it was weird that her name was included. But then also, it's eerie because if it's not them, then somebody knows all of their names. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Really yeah, creepy. Yeah, that's, like, a, a vulnerable exposed feeling like their nicknames too it's not just like debra nicolette it's nick so so nick so ken wasn't there when the gust of wind came and the newspaper opened up and nick wasn't there for the footprints right so if this was a hoax that means the only person that could really be doing it is debbie right and i'm not saying she is just by process of elimination it seems like she would be the one that's been around for all of it right yeah I'm not sure if Nick was there for the footprints or not. I know there's like a very clear timeline given in the book. There was like this podcast I listened to. They literally talked about this case for like 10 hours <laughs> and I listened to almost all of it. I do um, not blame them. Yeah, it was it be, crazy. It's a long, yeah, this is a wild story. Yeah, so I've really tried to like condense it, but um, that's a really good point. I don't know if Nick was there or not. So they read this really weird message and they decide to leave it alone for now because they're not, I mean, what are you going to do? Uh, perhaps who had written the message had been at the high school and they stored the message on the computer's floppy drive. But a few days later, Ken would find a second message saved on the computer. The file was named Re8, R-E-A-T-E. 
And this time, it seems to be some archaic version of British English. Like, is it like... Is There's it... no pressure to do British accent. No. Like, <laughs> I would like love you, it, but you don't, you have, don't to. have to do it, Charlie. No, You're not so letting cool. anyone down if you don't do it. No nah. one will be disappointed if it's, you don't do it. It wasn't in my head, but now it's in my head. So, like... <laughs> it does say thou. I'm just saying. I'm not... Thou? And must with an E. Must it. <laughs> you... You did Shakespeare. I did do Shakespeare. You so did you. What strange words thou speak. Although I must confess I have been ill-schooled, thou art a goodly man <laughs> who has fanciful woman and dwell in mine home. Tis a fitting place with lights which devil maketh and costly things only mine friend Edmund can afford <laughs> or the <laughs> king that himself. Eat. Twas a greatest crime to hath bribed mine house. Bribe? LW. LW. Listen, I've been ill schooled. That is, I, we got to bring that back. Ill schooled. Like they're saying, my bad, <laughs> I'm wrong, my mistake. I've been ill schooled, my friend. <laughs> yeah, I like that actually. Uh, is that, it's like almost Middle English. It's weird though, because it, it just seems like there's all these words misspelled, yeah. but it's, it fits it's yeah lw well, i mean like mm -hmm. you see you still see like shop but it's like two p's an e. and an e like shoppy shoppy yeah or theater yeah R -E. yeah yeah and there's no one throughout this whole story besides this lw person that has the lw initials too lw basically to break this message down claimed mm -hmm. that they had lived in either this house or a house on the same site and demanded to know why Ken, Debbie, and Nick were in their house. The writer also seemed to be able to see them because the first line of this message is what strange words thou speak, yeah. indicating that they're talking strangely to them. Yeah. And this takes place in the 80s, right? Yes. 1984 yeah. or 5 is when this all starts, depending on the sources you read. So in my head, everyone has a mullet. It's Instantly. just Stranger Things. Oh uh, yeah, Dude, I, I wonder. Love that. I want maybe like eight nineteen eighty four technology was like the last that ghosts could conquer because you don't really <laughs> hear too much about like instant messaging or. Hold up, we we literally just had an episode where about the oh the Zozo TV and it was like on a phone. That's true. That is one of the scariest stories I've ever heard. And LW also seemed confused by Ken and Debbie's electricity when they said, light the devil makes. They think that they were referring to the uh, electricity. And then basically there is going to end up being so many messages that they get from this LW person and some other message they get at this point. At some point, LW uses the term sorry if I say this wrong, Leem's Boist, which means box of lights. So oh, okay. they're basically like, what is this box of lights? Like, what is this computer? Okay. Interesting. I said LW stands for Little Wayne, right? <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize. Hey, he, he does spit some mad rhymes, you know? Yeah. Okay. So before I go any further, I am curious, Tyler, Charlie, what would you guys do? If you got a message like this, and I think the context is important, like imagine your college age, you're living with some friends, would you respond to this message? And what would you say if you did respond? I think we'd be remiss if we didn't respond to it. Yeah. I mean, in this day and age, I would just screenshot to send it to Charlie. Yeah, right. That'd be the first thing I would do. But like Charlie and I lived together when we were you know, in the early age, 20s. Yeah. Um, we had an apartment. So I feel like we would like all get together and like probably like write a message but we would all together. probably figure out probably who is like i think the biggest thing would be deciding who is going to be the one to actually type it alex it would be alex we would have probably forced our friend alex <laughs> yeah. i feel like then there's that connection where it's like you know if someone if there's a movie someone's gonna die it's the person who wrote it yes first yeah i feel like we would respond it would yeah. just be like we would all want to be there would we even think in that moment to record it i, I don't, don't think, think we so. would which is really sad i think kids <laughs> nowadays would but we didn't. We wouldn't have. Mm -mm. I don't think so. I probably would. Kaja, would you have responded? I feel like I would have responded. Yeah. Um. But I probably would have just asked, like, who is this? Or like in this day and age, I probably would have been like, wrong number. <laughs> just hit up with a meme or something. <laughs> or just see the one with the girl with her hand up, like. 
Yes. Who is this? Hit him with WT. Or what? Dwight from the office. Yeah. So Ken is very confused about these messages, especially since the second one has come through. So what Ken decides to do is he printed these two messages and he brought them to school and showed them to some colleagues. I'm assuming he printed them at the school uh, and like had saved them on the floppy. And when he's showing them to the colleagues, they all are just like, you know, this is some silly joke or prank until he shows the messages to an older English teacher named Peter. And Peter actually was Ken's English teacher when he was younger. But Peter basically looks at these printed messages and Ken kind of gives this cryptic answer of like why he needs these uh, basically interpreted. Like he wants someone to transcribe them into more modern interpretations to make sense of them and then also try to place them like does this uh dialect make sense with where we live uh tell me about the punctuation the vocabulary everything like does this seem uh like a hoax or is this possible and peter is also curious he's like i don't understand like what is this for and eventually ken tells him what's going on in his house and i feel like peter would be like into our podcast because he was immediately <laughs> like uh i'm super into this and yes i will help you he's like ken we're starting a podcast <laughs> you don't know what this is yet and I'm, they won't catch on for about 40 more years but so peter gets to work on the transcriptions helping make the messages more modern and easy to understand he's also carefully looking at the vocabulary and the punctuation he estimated the writings had come from some time between the 15th and 16th century. Then Ken had an idea. With all of these messages he was receiving, would it be possible to send a message back? And if so, what would he ask this mysterious LW? LW had also explained they were writing on behalf of many. Did this mean that there were other entities that LW was speaking for in the house? Was the computer serving as some type of portal or Ouija board? Or did LW mean they were talking on behalf of all of the spirits in the world or around the area? I don't like that. Just speaking <laughs> on behalf of many. I don't like that either. I mean, because like L, Legion, like it's just not. Yeah. Ugh, I just don't. It's yeah. so creepy, right? I give Ken props, though, for like the way to approach these people. Like, that's what I was curious about is like to actually present it and ask them is one thing. But like the the what like, what do you think this is or why are you asking me this? Like, because you don't want to like just say, I think there's a ghost because then you're not going to get the best effort out of whoever you ask to yeah. help. So that's gonna, where I would mess up because like, I'd immediately be like, I think there's a ghost. They wrote me messages and then they throw me away in the lunatic asylum. Also, it's a little sad he needed help with interpreting this because I feel like even though it's written in an older style, yeah, it's not that bad. No, um, but that, I mean that's cool that he found Peter though, and is, I is down with it. I should have like double checked this, but I know that like some of at least some of the messages that I'm having y'all read are the more modern interpretations. There are that's some fair, fair. that are so hard to understand. Um, when I was listening to the, like that full deep dive podcast about it and I'll, I'll put them in my sources too but there they would read like the old old translation and then they would read like slightly more modern ones that still sounded kind of medieval okay, so, these are like like chaucer like these are like hard to read i think so yeah because like the ones that i used in my script are from like some of the web resources that i found mm -hmm. they're not from ken's book and i know ken's book has like all of the translations so ken would eventually write to lw saying dear lw thank you for your message we're sorry for disturbing you what would you like us to do did you live on a house on this land about 1620 do you want us to tell you more about our time who is Edmund Gray? Do you have a family? Is the King James or Charles? What is the charge house? Was this village called Doddleston in your life? Thank you very much for your messages. Thank you for not making us afraid. End quote. Holy shit. You, uh, this Ken would not be a good interviewer. <laughs> that is <laughs> LW is gonna look at this and be like, God damn, I'm gonna take a break. I, that is so many questions. I understand the intro. There's a lot at once. Maybe just like testing the water. Like he didn't know what it was going to happen. I guess. Yeah. I just, 
I don't know. That's it's a lot. I I would have started much smaller just to see if a response would even come. But yeah. I do like the like the questions I thought were cool were like who is like the, the king? king, you know, like Charles or James. Yeah, like what year it is. Like those those are kind of cool because I feel like if LW were to respond, it's kind of like okay, if there is some like meeting me halfway into like trying to understand where I'm coming from and what's going on. Exactly. Maybe make a more likely to respond or speak. Exactly. So Ken sends this message and then he goes out for a few hours. When he returned, he had a new message. It was an honest farm of oak and stone. It was helpful that you should tell me about thy time. Dost thou have a horse? <laughs> Edmund Gray, brother of John Gray, lives at the Kinnerton? Kinnerton Hall. Thy king, of course, is Henry thy eighth. Just the eighth, not die. Of course, is Henry the eighth, who is six and forty. I need woods of King James. Mine change horse is <laughs> a place of lore. Nope. Lure? lure? I don't know. Is a place <laughs> of lore schooling. LW. <laughs> Dost thou have Toyota? <laughs> I know. I love that part. He's like, uh, I don't know. Do you have a horse? Because <laughs> <laughs> there still I might be it. horses. Yeah, it doesn't mean he owns a horse what i feel like even if it was a horse in buggy life doesn't mean he has a horse. well no i think that he's asking like do you have the money for a horse dude so yeah it's not like are you guys still using horses it's like am i at least talking to someone well off enough to own a horse yeah like do you like mm. can you even like afford i got a six-year payment plan <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> imagine 450 a month it's like when horse. you watch those old movies they just take someone's horse like that's a lot of money <laughs> yeah i've had my car stolen <laughs> yeah. it sucks yeah it's really interesting because like Peter and Ken kind of become like the ultimate duo and they're like really trying to get to the bottom of this because at this point they still think that it's more than likely a hoax and so they're like spending all these hours in the library they're like doing all this research and with the help of Peter and after this third message Ken is starting to notice some discrepancies and historical errors in LW's messages leading him to believe that this, again, could be some type of hoax. For example, Kennerton Hall wouldn't be built for another 200 years, according to the time that L.W. was alive. There was also no mention of Edmund or John Gray in any record or document in the area. There was also the use of modern punctuation, like question marks, which would not have been used in writings from this time period. How do they get questions across? It's all the inflection. Oh, so, in writing? So if they think it's a hoax, why are they spending time researching? Like, I feel like yeah. I would be spending more time trying to catch yeah. the person. Because there's, there's no online, right? Like right. They, they, they have to go to the house and write the message. So, yeah. So, okay. They're not concerned that it's a human, quote, online doing this. If, if it's a hoax, they think it's someone in the house, correct? Is that the right train of thought? Yes. I mean, I wouldn't be, I'd be trying to like video camera. I don't think they had that back then. In the 80s, there's video quarters. 84? Yeah, you don't. It's home video. It's Bob Saget. Brick. The big old brick. Well, it's and hard to like hide. Hold it and you're like, camera. They got footprints on their walls. No one's going to notice a camera. <laughs> All I'm saying is, I don't think, like, if I, if I believed it to be true, I'd be researching heavy. If I thought it was a hoax, I'd be trying to catch the person I thought was doing it. Yeah, no, that that's very compelling. That makes a lot of sense. And it's interesting because like I know in Ken's book, he is almost like so, so certain and so against it being true that it's almost like extreme. Like it's so for like the I would say the first like two thirds of the book from what I've heard, it's it's so over the top of like just downplaying all of it and saying it's a hoax and it has to be a hoax. Uh, so that that's that's true that is kind of confusing i wonder if he has suspicions of who it is it has to be nick right like he got the computer for her i guess yeah and i can't remember when this happens but i know at some point because they they go to the library all the time um they're checking out these books and the librarian is like oh that's weird you're the second person to check out this book in the last oh. week but the Whoa. librarian, she they're like, who checked it out? And the librarian won't tell them. 
Who There's it like was. an oath in a library? <laughs> what? <laughs> I know. Are you kidding me? Oh my god. Like, get off your high horse, librarian. <laughs> Librarians, I'll never reveal my sources. <laughs> so over the span of about two years. 18 months to be exact, messages from LW would continue to appear on the BBC computer. And Ken was fully committed to figuring out who or what was behind them. He also couldn't help but feel the messages and the poltergeist activity in the home were somehow connected. LW would eventually share that his real name was Lucas Waynesman. And Lucas had been living in this same area and claimed to be writing from the year 1546. He also shared with Ken and Debbie that he had lost his wife and son in the plague. And he made a living as a simple rural farmer, harvesting barley and making cheese. He described the home he lived in as a modest one with red stone. Ken and Debbie's home was not red stone, but, when they were doing renovations and did some digging and looked under the kitchen, they discovered the foundation of another much older structure, which was made of red sandstone. Lucas initially claimed to have studied at Jesus College, Oxford, but this college was not founded until the 1570s. Because he was claiming to be from the 1540s, this may also be seen as a hoax. But then Lucas later said he had actually studied at Brazenos College, where he had met Erasmus several times. And he had later been forced to leave for failing to expunge the Pope's names from documents. So he basically like studied here and was like working at the college. And from what I heard, he was like working pretty high up. And then this like big time theologian came and he met him and all this stuff. And he was alive, Erasmus was alive during this time period. So it's like some things are accurate and some things aren't to the time period. So it's just really weird. And Erasmus is the theologian. Yes. Okay. I was like, I don't know who that is, but he must be a big deal. (laughs) I had to look him up, but yeah, Erasmus is his last name. And he was like this famous... A 16th century theologian pictures including a picture of erasmus that webster left out for lucas disappeared and i have a picture of the erasmus picture which i'll explain why we have a picture of it in a second but i just want you to like look at that picture nice jawline okay or not jawline <laughs> cheekbones cheek i thought that was a lady i did i don't know it's okay So this is Erasmus. And so basically, Ken was like, just so curious. And he's trying to figure out like what this person is doing or capable of if they're in the house or if they're doing something remote. So he's like leaving these pictures out. And when he left this picture out, it disappeared for a while, but then it returned. And when it returned, it looked like this, it looked like it had been like scorched. Yeah, I can see around on like the left. It's Say so it was covered in ectoplasm. Oh, man. Man, his I, f- I feel like Ken's quality of life probably is not doing too well right now. This is going on for 18 months. Yeah. Yeah, it, really it gets very intense. Is is Debbie and Nick still like hanging out and like down for the ride and everything? Uh, Nick, it's in my notes somewhere. Nick eventually moves out. Debbie stays around for pretty much everything, but they're fighting a lot. Uh, it's mm-hmm. getting like very intense. And this entity also really starts to mess with Debbie, which we will talk about. Yeah. So it makes you feel like it's not them if it's like, you know, if Debbie's like being harassed and Nick moves out. Yeah, if Nick moves out, then it doesn't, you know, you can't really use that anymore unless she's sneaking in all the time. That would be crazy. That would be crazy. But like, I feel like I'm so locked in on these messages on the computer that I'm kind of forgetting that they, they have experienced paranormal, yeah, you know, things as well. Right. Yeah. It's so it's, there's so many elements to it that you have to remember. I know that like the security at their house was very minimal. Like it's the eighties. They didn't have any type of system. They, it was the hangout house. So people were coming and going all the time. Uh, I don't know if anybody else had keys, but like they didn't really like lock their doors during the day or anything. And again, they had like those shared spaces of the houses. So Lucas would also send messages commenting on things going on at the cottage. 
uh, including a time that Ken had left out a photo of a Jaguar car because he likes cars. And Ken was basically trying to show him a car to explain like, this is how we get around now. And Lucas remarked about the car, <laughs> quote, I have found your picture of the cart, but it is a crude thing. For without the horse, it won't go far. I love okay. it. He just doesn't know. One day, Ken and Debbie are messaging Lucas again. And somehow the year that Ken and Debbie are living in, 1985, comes up. Lucas says something very strange. He said, I thought you were also from 2009, like your friend who brought the box of lights. Pray? Box 2109. Lights. Yeah, 2109. So Ken is like really confused by this message. He's like a friend of 2109. And so he's like, okay, maybe Lucas is confused. He thinks I'm from like the wrong year. Uh, maybe he forgot. We've talked about so many things. So Ken kind of writes back like, who is 2109? And then Ken gets a message with a writing style that he has never seen before. This is not Lucas. The message read, quote, We are sorry that we can give you only two choices. One, that you either have your predicament explained in such a way that you have instant understanding, but cause what should not happen. Or two, try to understand that you three have a purpose that shall in your lifetime change the face of history. We, 2109, must not affect your thoughts directly, but give you some sort of guidance that will allow room for your own destiny. All we can say is that we are all part of the same God, whatever he or whatever it is. Thank you for listening to Perplexity, a mystery podcast hosted, written, and produced by Kadra Brennan. If you enjoyed today's episode, tell the world about it by going to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and leaving a five-star review. It helps the show more than you know. Contact, support, and merch links can be found in the episode description. And if you have a story to share or a topic request, send an email to perplexitymysterypodcast at gmail.com. Cager would love to read your story on the podcast. Until next week, stay curious.